thanks everybody for being here. Uh, my name is Gail Good. I'm the director for the Air Management Program at the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, and I'm glad to be with you. I know you're um, really engaged in air quality work, and we're looking forward to sharing some information with you today. But I'll, I'll let Katie introduce herself before we dive in. All right, I'm Katie Prado. I'm the uh, air monitoring section chief for the state, and I've been doing that for about five years. So I know, thank you. I know you have a, a, um, a lot of interest in ozone issues, and for for very good reason. And we are going to talk about um, certainly um, some of the ozone air quality issues that are impactful on the Lake Michigan shoreline, in particular Sheboygan. But we wanted to also take the opportunity here tonight to talk to you a bit more about kind of the full program approach that goes into resolving um, non-attainment issues like ozone. Um, and just give you a little bit more um, information about what our program does and um, how the pieces fit together to work toward resolving um, air quality issues. So um, the slide that Katie's got up here, and thanks for running those. Um, you know, we, we went through a process to, to talk about, you know, what it is that we do from kind of a strategic planning perspective and, and what really our, our jobs are, why do we do what we do. And really when we took a look at this as a program, we talked about, you know, really what we're trying to do is enhance the quality management and protection of the state's air resources. That's an important resource and that's our job to protect that, protect health and the environment. So that's kind of long term, and it is a long game when you're talking about air quality issues, for sure, and you're very well aware of that. <laughs> but long term, that's, that's, um, that's our goal, and that's what we're trying to do. Our program works at that um, by uh, utilizing state and federal uh, rules, laws, statutes related to air quality, and following those. Um, and with the, the Clean Air Act as kind of our, as our guide um, to, to be able to um, implement laws that help us achieve air quality goals. So some of our kind of larger priorities then are obviously working to attain the National Ambient Air Quality Standards. Sometimes we say NACs. That's what we mean, National Ambient Air Quality Standards. So you may hear some acronyms tonight. And by the way, this is intended to be very conversational. So if you know we're saying something that doesn't make sense, pl please ask a question. Or if I let an acronym slip out, because we got a whole language in the air management program, just, just stop me and please ask for, for clarification. Happy to pause. So you know, long term, some of our priorities, obviously, are to, to attain those National Ambient Air Quality Standards and to work toward attainment um, across the state. To make sure that we're providing information to people, that's a very high priority for us, to be able to make informed decisions about how they you know, manage their lives, their to-dos, um, er and everything that, that you um, take on in your day relative to air quality, that is important. And we want to be able to also, we, ha we need to work with um, some of our sources, so we provide them compliance assistance to help make sure that they can be um, you know, in, in compliance or kind of uh, acting relative to what their permit tells them to do and making sure that they're um, able to, to do that and understand what their permit says and how they comply with it. So those are, I think, some of our higher priorities and how we kind of work toward as a program uh, making sure that we're um, providing, you know, the, the best air quality that we can and that we're um, working kind of across our entire program um, to be able to do that. You can maybe go to the next slide. I mentioned the Clean Air Act is really kind of our, our guide. We're really implementing the Federal Clean Air Act. And just wanted to give you a little bit of an idea from, you know, kind of 1990 on. And there's a, a lot on there on that slide. But what I want you to take away from that is that the Clean Air Act was really desi designed to bring down um, emissions of some of the common pollutants, things like nitrogen oxides, right, that make up um, one of the ingredients of ozone. And it's really intended to do that while also allowing for innovation and, and economic growth, which you know we certainly have, have seen as a country um, since the Clean Air Act. So, but what we've been able to see is with the, that kind of federal backbone and the regulation that the Clean Air Act provides and state law provides, we really have seen emissions of pollutants come down quite a bit. But you know, right, the work is, is not over, right? The, the ozone issue 
um, especially along the Lake Michigan shoreline here, remains something um, that we continue to study, work toward, work with our sources on, work with you all on, um, work with our researchers on to try and understand you know, how we're going to be able to bring the area, this area, lakeshore area, into attainment for ozone while managing some of the other different pollutants that, that we need to manage. Um, EPA um, sets, and there's that acronym NACS, National Ambient Air Quality Standards. Um, EPA periodically looks at some of those common pollutants, and you can see some of them here, and I apologize for how small some of them are. Um, but EPA looks at these on a periodic basis and makes sure that they're using the most up-to-date science and um, health information to make sure that they are setting standards for these pollutants that take health um, into account, not cost health. Um, so I wanted to mention that. Some of the, the um, standards that you know, I think you all are very familiar with, kind of right in the middle of that is, is ozone. And actually, um, EPA is uh, kind of going through a process right now of looking at the ozone standard and deciding if it needs to be revised. Yay. We'll expect some information on that in the near future. Um, also, one of the pollutants that I wanted to mention to you too, also a regional or, uh, pollutant like ozone, so something that kind of moves around and can be transported. Um, they looked at the, EPA recently looked at the particulate matter standard and proposed some revision to that. So it's, I see a lot of heads nodding, which is great. You're, you're really well aware of that, and that's um, actually something that's out for public comment right now. And you, you are all very engaged. I encourage you to, to put some comments in um, if you do have them. But they did, in that um, proposed revision, Take a look at the uh, PM25 or fine particle standard. Tiny, tiny particles that we can inhale, get into our lungs, get some, it can get into the bloodstream and cause a host of, of health issues. So it's an important pollutant like ozone to, to have um, periodic review of and standards on that we can be working toward. So I wanted to mention that one too, that that's something we're paying very close attention to um, as it's another very important health uh, pollutant. I'm going to turn it over to Katie to talk to you a little bit more about monitoring for a bit and the work that she does. All right, thanks, Gail. So the primary mission of the monitoring group is consistent with the air management team as a whole. So we ensure the NACs are attained and maintained through the monitoring of air quality at various locations throughout the state. So the first goal, the specific goal, is speaks right to that, is to judge compliance and progress made towards meeting those attainment goals. But then we also observe pollution trends throughout the state. So as you can see, our, our data goes back, you know, you'll, you'll see on future slides, our data goes back um, over 30 years in a lot of cases. So it gives you a really good long-term look at um, air quality throughout the state. We do this through an annual trends report that's released every October, so be on the lookout for that. Um, we alert the public to changing air quality. You can see the visual of the map there. Um, some areas are in the moderate in this example. There, we also have a listserv where people can sign up and get text notifications for your specific area if it, if it is in an alert that day. Um, and then we... I think that's really important, and if folks even... And we got the slides from y'all, and that's really great. And hopefully we can highlight this one. But you can screenshot this, because it's really great to, to get those air quality alerts. Um, they've really gotten a lot better, even like yeah. the day before, kind of looking at some trends and stuff. So it's, it's, it's a really helpful tool. That's great. That's great feedback. And that's like why we do what we do. So we're happy to hear that. Thank you. Um, and I'll get you the specific link. Yep, go ahead. Do you ever put those air quality alerts on television? Sometimes they get picked up by local meteorologists. We you don't. Mean, we, you send them out, or people meteorologists have to go find them. We send them out on all of our social media platforms, and they're plugged into those. But and then we also work with the National Weather Service, and we let them know. So meteorologists at a television station usually that's their first place they look. But yeah, and I think like with the PM with the wildfires, that was getting a lot. A lot of media attention. <laughs> when there are major alerts in terms of trends in particular areas, uh, is information sent to the local, if you want to call the press local, uh, newspapers 
to inform people of what's going on in the areas where there's a problem uh, emerging or present or in the future? I think those people would have to be signed up to receive the alerts specifically, but um, they're we do our best to get it on all the platforms that they access on a regular basis. So then it's, they have the information. I think it's just whether or not they post it that day. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, we provide a database for research, which kind of drives a lot of the um, policy that we use for ozone attainment planning, which I'll, tell, I'll get more into in the enhanced ozone monitoring section. Here's an example of a monitoring network site. This is, uh, I'm, now I've kind of added on that this is a regulatory monitoring site because of the crop up of so many sensors in the area. I always like to explain the difference. So this is really prescribed by the Clean Air Act of exactly where it needs to be located, exactly the parameters being measured there, and how we're measuring them. So a couple of examples just from this picture that this meteorological tower is required to be 10 meters, and it's required to be audited once a year. Um, this inlet probe can only be located in that location at this site, and there's Teflon tubing that runs from the outside, gathering outside air at a known flow rate, and it pulls it into the back of many different uh, analyzers. So there's one tube for each pollutant that we monitor at each site. And even the tube material and diameter is prescribed in the Clean Air Act. Um, and then the, the instruments that collect data in that way, they report real-time data to the public on air quality conditions. So I'll show you an example again of that map. But this map, so this is what we have online reporting real-time air quality. And then if you, so, I thought I had a different one. <laughs> but th we have a lot more monitors than are, are located here, but are displayed here, right? <laughs> I don't know what happened. <laughs> I don't think it is. <laughs> um, so uh, there are, there's another type of monitoring that we do, and that's called discrete monitoring. And it's usually those samples are maybe on a filter or collected in a canister, and they need to go to a lab for analysis. And we get the, the data a little bit. Um, we can't get that data in real time due to that. So we have about 40 monitoring sites throughout the state. These are uh, the ones that plug into this map are primarily uh, the continuous criteria pollutants, most notably PM 2.5 and ozone. And the location of these, like I said, um, that the, the site, as I used in a, as an example, is really a good example of how prescriptive the Clean Air Act is and where we locate these monitors. So they prescribe really rigid and specific monitoring requirements that are um, associated with the network design. And they set definitive requirements for siting, so there's no gray area. And to be responsible stewards of federal and state funding, we make it a priority to only monitor where required and we make this process public, which that's required. Um, so we define the timelines and expectations for core work through this as well. This takes, these requirements take a lot of people time. Um, an example is that an ozone monitor needs to be checked every 14 days and a, that's a quality control check that we submit to EPA. So that's kind of the scope of the work that the regulatory monitoring network takes. Can I mention too, just that, so your second monitor here follows all of that um, same procedure, even though it is cited, and some, some of you who may have been part of that, it was cited not because it had to be, but because you know, we wanted to have an, another data point. And you know, a, a lot of folks in, in this county in particular were um, instrumental in, in helping make sure that we could be able to, to do that. But it follows all of those same requirements, procedures, very prescriptive um, you know, citing requirements and, and so on to make sure that it is um, absolutely comparable to the regulatory required monitor at Sheboygan Kohler Andre. Yeah. Can I ask a question, Gail, about that? So, for, as everybody may know, we have two monitors in Sheboygan County, which is not required by the EPA because we are a smaller population. 
Um, but because that second monitor at Haven is technically a state monitor, right, is there a chance that the state could come back and say, we don't want to have this anymore? Um, or does the EPA say you have such an interesting and unique situation going on in Sheboygan? We, we think you should keep it. So at this point, we've utilized it for um, state planning processes and what's called a state implementation plan, basically kind of a set of rules about how you're going to, to try to attain NACs and do, do a lot of your other air quality work. We've used that second monitor at Sheboygan Haven to show that, you know, what we know through decades of research, that there is a lakeshore impact and that there is um, certainly uh, uh, elevated concentrations at the shoreline that do decrease as you move inland. And we've utilized that monitor to show that and, and you all have a non-attainment area that reflects that, right? You have a partial county non-attainment area. So at this point, we wouldn't be shutting that monitor down. We're not able to because we've utilized it for state planning purposes. Good question. And I'll just um, add that Sora is always really good about the annual monitoring network plan process, and we always appreciate your comments. So, um, so it's a 30-day public comment period, and the the meeting we hold a public meeting normally around mid-May, and then. It's due for submittal to EPA by July 1st, and then they respond with a approval in 90 days. So here's a, a little bit of a video on um, ozone and just a really high level background. I'll note that there is an update that we need to make to this video, but we'll explain it in future slides. It's a, a previous non-attainment area, that which has been updated. Ozone, it's good up high, but bad nearby. The ozone that naturally forms in the Earth's upper atmosphere and protects us from the sun's harmful UV rays is the same chemical compound that forms at ground level, where we live, work, and play. However, unlike in the upper atmosphere, ground level ozone can have an adverse impact on health. When inhaled, it can irritate the lining of the respiratory tract, including the nose, throat, and lungs. Plants can feel the impacts of ground level ozone pollution too. Trees and other plants, including crops like corn and soybeans, can begin to show signs of distress after high levels of ozone are present for a few days. Ground-level ozone is not directly emitted from smokestacks or tailpipes, but forms via chemical reactions in the atmosphere between other pollutants like volatile organic compounds and oxides of nitrogen. These ozone precursors are mainly emitted from sources that burn fossil fuels like coal, gas, or diesel. The ozone precursors that affect Wisconsin's air quality may originate in other states, particularly those to the south. The highest measured ozone concentrations typically occur downwind of urban areas on hot sunny days with light winds. Therefore, the department monitors for ozone from spring through fall. The DNR Air program monitors for ozone at 30 monitoring stations throughout the state and shares the information with the public in near real time. Wisconsin counties along Lake Michigan experience the highest ozone concentrations on days with southerly winds, which transport ozone precursors north into Wisconsin. Ozone transport occurs when the winds blow precursors out over Lake Michigan, where they react in the presence of sunlight to form ozone. When the land has warmed sufficiently, temperature changes from the shoreline to the lake can create pressure differences, which cause an onshore flow of air, or lake breeze. Winds from the south, in combination with the lake breeze, push ozone formed over the lake onshore, causing ozone concentrations in Wisconsin to be closely correlated with the distance from the Lake Michigan shoreline. Winds from the south carry the ozone plume gradually northward along Wisconsin's coastline. While the state currently has portions of Lakeshore counties in non-attainment of the ozone standard, the vast majority of Wisconsin's population lives in areas meeting all federal air quality standards. Overall, ozone pollution in the state has decreased over the last two decades, and emissions of ozone precursors in the state have decreased by 50% since 2002. Reducing ozone levels along the lakeshore requires a regional, multi-state approach. In addition to the ozone monitoring network, DNR has a state-of-the-art mobile air monitoring lab used to measure a suite of pollutants, including ozone precursors, along Wisconsin's lakeshore. Informed by DNR's air quality forecast, the mobile lab is deployed throughout the summer to capture ozone precursor measurements when elevated levels of ozone are predicted. Real-time ozone levels can be viewed at any monitor by visiting DNR's air quality map. 
We can all play a role in reducing ozone formation across Wisconsin. Vehicles continue to be the largest source of ozone forming pollutants in Wisconsin. Consider taking the bus, carpooling, or biking to work or school. Other small tasks can continue to improve Wisconsin's air quality as well. Consider the use of electric lawn equipment instead of equipment with gas-powered motors. Conserve energy around the house by turning off lights and appliances when not in use. Wisconsin is committed to clean air. For more information, visit dnr.wi.gov and search air quality. So um, that just gave kind of a really high level overview, like I said. But here we're showing our most recent uh, ozone design values throughout the state. And just as background, a design value is a statistic that describes the air quality status at a given location relative to the level of the national ambient air quality standard. So this, these design values uh, represent three years worth of data. Um, the reason why it's 2021 was the last year is because we're still working on certifying the 2022 data. So this is the most recent design value we have available. It showed decreases in ozone values kind of overall, small decreases, but most noticeably in the lakeshore regions. Um, despite that, five of 13 lakeshore monitors exceeded the 2015 ozone NACs of 70 ppbs. Um, and no sites that we categorize as inland or far north had um, any exceedances of the NACs. So now I'll pass it to Gail to more specifically talk about non-attainment uh, related to these design values. And I'll just point out before I do that, it's very, here's the Sheboygan Kohler Andre monitor that's, that's at 72, which is kind of actually a little lower than we're, we're used to. And Chiwaki Prairie, those are kind of our notoriously elevated monitors and that one's lower than normal too. Thanks Katie. So those design values that Katie mentioned, those kind of three-year values um, are what is compared to the standard. When EPA sets a new standard like they did in 2015, that, that begins kind of an opportunity to determine what areas are attaining or not attaining, not meeting that standard. Um, so this is to, this is um, intended to show you some of the non-attainment areas um, across the country, and then to show you the non-attainment areas, the current non-attainment areas um, here in the state. So you'll notice, you know, across the country, if you kind of look at that that uh, map of the nation there. You were used to seeing some of our, like California's um, in non-attainment for a number of different standards and works very hard to, to try to reach attainment. You also see the northeast part of the country also um, at times struggling with non-attainment. They actually struggle with ozone non-attainment, similar to how we do here with transported emissions and um, in that case kind of sea breeze effects. So just interesting, it's something that, um, you know, we, we know that we have in common with them and we do work at times with, with um, folks there because they've done a lot of research to like some of the research um, that we're trying to do here with, with partners. So we do try to work with um, some of our friends across the country who are experiencing similar issues. Here in the state, um, you can see the map there to the right kind of showing some of the non-attainment areas here. Um, the, the pink, that's Sheboygan County or partial Sheboygan County non-attainment for the 2015 ozone standard. That larger green area just south of that is the five county or portions of counties um, in the Milwaukee area. And then that orange portion um, to the south, that's Kenosha County. And that portion that's in non-attainment there is also tied to uh, the, the Chicago non-attainment area with um, uh, parts of, of counties in Illinois and Indiana as well. So it's, it's interesting. You know, we're really impacted here, not only um, uh, not, not only that, that Kenosha County portion of the Chicago non-attainment area, but uh, Sheboygan as well is also really heavily impacted. Um, the video says areas to our south. <laughs> the um, Illinois and Indiana are actually two of the larger contributors to ozone concentrations here. Um, they actually contribute more than Wisconsin sources do. Um, so just wanted to mention that and just kind of give you a little bit of an idea of what our non-attainment areas are. That was the piece I think in the video that Katie mentioned needs to be updated. Um, those areas are a little different um, due to a court case. Um, 
I know the answer, but um, <laughs> can, can you just explain, you said like that Kenosha is part of the Chicago not gaming area, can you like explain a little bit more in depth for other people that don't know that like it's multiple monitors mm -hmm. and yeah, so they, and you just let me know if I'm not getting this quite right or not explaining this, um, getting to the, to what you wanted to um, make sure folks know about. Thanks for the question. Yeah, there are a number of different monitors in that Chicago non-attainment area. Um, a couple in Kenosha County, right, the Chiwaki Prairie on the lakeshore, um, and the Kenosha Water Tower, which is a little further inland, and then a number of monitors in um, the portions of, the, of Illinois and Indiana that make up that Chicago non-attainment area. Area. And it really, it takes one monitor in that area. Chewaukee Prairie has at times been the controlling monitor for that area. It's not currently. Um, but it takes one monitor in that area um, violating the standard to, to keep that area um, in non-attainment. So that's interesting. At times, um, I mentioned Wisconsin or Chewaukee Prairie has been sort of the controlling monitor there. Um, I think more currently, it was a monitor um, in, in Illinois. Um, and that, that's just interesting too because we know that we're impacted by emissions from those areas as well in the state, both right, like I said, at, at, uh, in Kenosha at Chewaukee Prairie and also going up the shoreline um, due to meteorology, transported emissions, et cetera, um, even here in Sheboygan. Did I get it what you were hoping? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> Um, wanted to just talk about, you know, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about enhanced ozone monitoring and some of the more kind of research and research leading to policy decisions work that we're doing. But a non-attainment area um, and it really has a number of different requirements with it. Enhanced ozone monitoring is one. So as you, um, areas are kind of classified, non-attainment areas are classified kind of by how much they violate a standard. So, um, and you all are pro probably pretty aware of this, that, that you kind of came in at, with the 2015 standard at a marginal level or kind of the lowest level of non-attainment. The EPA and the Clean Air Act gives an area so much time to meet a standard. When they when you, they do not, then that area does what's called a bump up. It bumps up in kind of its severity of non-attainment classification. And as an area continues to you know maybe not achieve the standard, not attain, and continues to bump up, there are a number of different requirements that go along in, with that non-attainment area. The goal there is to try to reduce emissions enough to meet the standard. So as an area does not do that, the EPA and the Clean Air Act will add in other requirements. Those requirements may impact things like um, stationary sources or power plants, paper mill, you know, things like that that you're used to, factories, et cetera, um, manufacturing, things that you're used to seeing as kind of a stationary source or pollution source facility. Um, it may... I'm sorry? Um, no. Those are not um, part of how we try to achieve non-attainment. That's important, though, for, for other things, maybe like climate change. Um, we also, and I think the video actually noted this, that one of the largest sources of emissions that leads to ozone non-attainment issues, and PM25 issues too, by the way, it, are mobile sources. So things like cars, trucks, on-road, off-road, you know, all kinds of different um, mobile source type of equipment. That's actually, of, the, of what we control here in the state as far as emissions, mobile sources is one of the biggest contributors and we don't regulate those. So we have to work with um, the EPA and federal partners to make sure that you know, where they set rules and laws to control those emissions, that they're doing that. So we're really vocal on mobile source emissions at DNR. When we see new rules coming out about that, um, we want to make sure that EPA is kind of pulling their weight where, where they can, where they need to, since that's not something we regulate. We know we're really heavily impacted um, by, by you know, car, truck, um, et cetera, construction equipment, that kind of, those kinds of emissions. Um, they're just a, a whole range. I won't go through all the different kind of, you know, things that, that go into non-attainment area requirements as you go up in severity of classification, but it's a, a lot. It's, it's more than, you know, further tightening down on a facility or, you know, f uh, inspection and maintenance programs for vehicles and things like that. There's just a lot of requirements that go into trying to attain that standard. So I wanted to give you a little bit of a, uh, just a, a look at that. 
Um, going on here a little bit, there is some upcoming action that we wanted to make you aware of. Um, and this is called the, um, just going to talk about ozone transport and FIP. That means federal implementation plan. So transport, you guys know this, you've been, you're impacted by transported emissions. Um, and the EPA has been doing some work to try to address some of those transported emissions that, that impact um, kind of areas downwind. Um, so back in February last year, EPA proposed a, a transport rule to address what's called good neighbor obligations or how one area impacts another area. And they are working toward um, finalizing, EPA is working toward actually finalizing that transport federal implementation plan. So basically what they've said is states, you guys have a good neighbor obligation. You have to be good to one another and reduce emissions and work this out. And what um, that's through a state implementation plan process. And when EPA comes in with the FIP, they, they're saying, okay, we didn't get there, so now we're gonna impose um, additional rulemaking at the federal level to try and address this issue and to try and make sure that we can see emissions reductions. Um, this rule in particular looks at, um, and historically has looked at emissions reductions at power plants. Um, this time around, they added a number of other industrial type sources, um, mostly like uh, manufacturers of cement, pulp and paper mills, um, other places, other facilities that might have really big boilers, high temperature combustion, um, and more NOx emissions. So in this case, EPA really looked at oxides of nitrogen and trying to further regulate those and bring emissions down of those. We're expecting a finalization on that um, just coming right up. March 15th, actually, EPA is under a consent decree deadline or legal deadline to finalize this, sign off, and um, uh, basically finalize the FIP. So we don't know what's in it. We did comment on this. I think you guys may have too. Um, we commented um, on the proposal. Um, we will find out soon um, how those comments were addressed and how EPA actually ends up finalizing this transport FIP. This is important because in this case, um, it, this kind of go around or with the proposal, EPA did not actually address sources that are impacting Sheboygan. So we really commented heavily that, you know, this is a monitor um, that, you know, tends to be some of the, our, our highest ozone concentrations in the state. It's really important that this monitor at Sheboygan Kohler Andre is analyzed and that downwind emissions are addressed. So we'll see how that resolves. We, we don't know, but um, we commented heavily. I actually um, spoke to Office of Air Quality Planning and Standards who puts this rule together just with that point in mind that Sheboygan's very important. If we can resolve those in issues at Sheboygan, we really feel that you know other areas will be resolved as well since this tends to be one of the highest uh, monitor concentrations in the state. So we really needed EPA to, to you know, address this, analyze it, and address downwind emissions. So that's just one of the things um, that we're trying to do. You need to be very vocal and to communicate with EPA and make sure that we are um, seeing issues addressed here, especially transported emissions. Um, the next slide there just gives you a little bit of an idea of what EPA is looking at in this transport rule. It's a lot of different states. Basically what EPA says is if an area, if a, like a, um, a, a state contributes 1%, 1% of um, emissions and monitored concentration to somebody downwind, that's significant. And they should be analyzing that and making sure that there are emissions reductions from those other states. So a lot of areas are pulled into this, this transport federal implementation plan. A lot of states that weren't necessarily part of it before. And I mentioned some industry that wasn't necessarily part of prior transport rules. So this one's been really interesting and we're really anxiously waiting the finalization of this, which we expect to see, as I said, around March 15th. I'm gonna pause, it's a lot. Let me just see if there are any questions on anything transport related. Yes, please. Yeah, could you clarify, you mentioned that some were included, that you were including yeah. some, could you clarify that? Like some sources? Yeah, um, in this case, what wasn't included was actually the analysis for Sheboygan. So any sources that are south of Sheboygan, right, because that's typically, that's where our transported emissions come that, that impact um, this area. Those 
sources, like so there's power plants, there's um, maybe paper mills or other kind of manufacturing, steel manufacturing as well, which there's a lot of steel manufacturing south of us. Um, those weren't specifically analyzed relative to the monitored concentration here in Sheboygan. So that's, that's you know, important for us to make a comment on and to try to see some resolution on. Does that help? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Can you just explain Texas to me? Explain. <laughs> oh, I gotcha. Yeah, we're impacted by a lot of states. I understand that. Mm -hmm. Texas? Yes, Texas. Can you explain how? <laughs> yeah, we actually, so we work with an organization, a technical organization called LADCO, or Lake Michigan Air Directors Consortium. They do a lot of our technical kind of modeling work and a lot of um, analysis of, of things like that. This is all based on um, very scientific, very detailed um, photochemical modeling. So LADCO is a, a really great partner to us in kind of looking at what's happening. When they look at things like Texas, it's a lot of like, um, there's a lot of oil down there and a lot of processing of that. We think that some of it is maybe coming from, you know, we may be really impacted by things like that. So there's a lot more work that needs to be done for us to understand how much we're impacted by them, but it's really important that if, if we are in Wisconsin, that those emissions are being addressed and that they're reducing those. Because that's, you know, you can't control what's happening in Texas, right? Or for that matter, any of these other states that are noted here. So it's really important that um, EPA uh, set a path for that. And so, yeah, go ahead. So your information up there says contributes to, mm -hmm. and you just said maybe. Yeah, they contribute, 1% or more. Okay, makes no sense to me. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question, yeah. And so that, that contribution, is that like on a high ozone day, or is that just like an like any time, you know, like is it a, a high ozone data violation of the EPA standard or is it just any time? Yeah, they do look during the ozone season um, and then look and study some of the, the high ozone days and, and, um, and kind of start from there. So, yeah, I mean, in order to really make sure that they're analyzing some of the highest episodes and kind of when you're seeing your highest concentrations, they do focus there during the season on higher days. And daily winds a big, big factor too, right? Daily winds. Yeah, and you, you know, what's interesting in the video, I think does a nice job of highlighting this. You know, we see higher ozone concentrations during the summer months when you might see, you know, nice high pressure system to our south, southerly winds, right, bringing that that warm, you know, sunny, wonderful temperatures and weather. And that's, that's really a, just a great um, catalyst for ozone formation, right? Because it pulls up all of the, the to the south, transported emissions, um, puts them out over Lake Michigan, right? They cook on that, in that hot sun, on that warm summer day, and then with the lake breeze, um, that, those ozone, that those ozone concentrations actually make their way on shore. And remember, the video also does a nice job, I think, saying ozone isn't directly emitted. It's formed um, through chemical reactions in the presence of sunlight from oxides of nitrogen and volatile organic compounds, or kind of like toxics. So there's a lot of different pollutants that can go into making up ozone. But yeah, summer months, southerly winds, transported emissions from the south, just as you see here, all the right ingredients. The other thing, too, with climate change, you know, we're not doing a great job turning down that cooking heat. Doesn't seem to be. It's a gradual process as far as trying to control it, but that's such a big factor in terms of creating ozone. Yeah, we do try to keep an eye on kind of how the summer is progressing and how hot it is. And we have had a number of hotter summers, especially in the the last decade or so. You're absolutely right. Yeah, that's a good lead-in because um, Gail had mentioned precursors and volatile organic compounds. So um, enhanced ozone monitoring is designed to measure just that and kind of understand a little bit more specifics about the precursors that are impacting us on the highest reported days. 
Um, so we were required to have the enhanced ozone monitoring plan, as Gail mentioned, because of the moderate area, non-attainment area. So um, we've been kind of in and out of that moderate um, classification since 2000. So we've been at it for a few years with this. Uh, we had the mobile air monitoring lab, which you saw in the video, located at the Sheboygan Spaceport uh, site for two years, where we operated MET CO, NOx by CAPS, uh, ozone, and PM 2.5. And we also did precursor sampling through uh, VOC and carbonyl sampling. So that was speciated VOCs, so we could kind of break apart the different compounds that are affecting us on those days where we get higher concentrations. We also did this at Chiwaki in an attempt, so Chiwaki's that, uh, the purple one, this was, I took a screenshot this day because it was one of the highest days I'd ever <laughs> seen. <laughs> um, so the we were trying to kind of differentiate between those two sites and try to determine, you know, from based on monitoring data what we could, we had, um, any authority to control so we could impact those really high concentration days. We do um, planning for this through the annual network plan process every year. So we have, um, I'll give a plug for the what we're planning for next year. Brad will be at the a AMAG meeting in on June 1st. So Rebecca, write it down. <laughs> Um, so that's kind of our summary of ozone, and if you have any questions, we can go into that more. But we did want to talk a little bit more about particulate matter, and um, you know, it's kind of a hot topic right now with the new T PM next out there. So we do have another video. So. Wisconsin's air quality continues to improve. One example of this is the success story that is particulate matter. Particulate matter is made up of solid particles or liquid droplets and is grouped into two size categories, PM10 and PM2.5. PM10 has a diameter of 10 micrometers or less, while PM2.5 has a diameter of 2.5 micrometers or less. Compare particulate matter size with the diameters of a human hair or a grain of sand, and it's easy to see just how small particulate matter can be up to 30 times smaller than the width of a human hair and 40 times smaller than a grain of sand. PM10 and PM2.5 originate from different sources. PM10 can come for crushing or grinding operations as well as roadway dust. PM2.5 is mostly formed in the atmosphere from chemical reactions between other pollutants. Sources of PM2.5 primarily include motor vehicle engines, high temperature combustion, and certain agricultural processes. While all particulate matter can pose a health risk, PM2.5 poses the greatest risk because of its ability to penetrate deep into the respiratory tract and into the bloodstream. Once in the bloodstream, these particles can be pumped throughout the body and can cause health problems for individuals with heart and lung ailments. The Wisconsin DNR monitors air quality in over 40 locations across the state. About half of these monitoring stations monitor for either PM2.5 or PM10. The Wisconsin DNR has also worked with sources over the years to control and reduce emissions that contribute to particulate matter. This photo, for example, shows a dust suppression process that is used at quarries. Cleaner burning fuels and more stringent vehicle emission standards have also dramatically reduced particulate matter emissions. As a result, particulate matter has been decreasing across the state for years. Over the last decade, PM2.5 concentrations have decreased by 30% and the entire state meets all state and federal air quality standards for particulate matter. Federal requirements, cleaner fuels, and voluntary actions taken by Wisconsin citizens have helped reduce the overall level of particulate matter in our air. Here are some tips to consider on reducing your impact. Minimize fuel by reducing idling, anticipating stops, and using cruise control. Buy food grown in Wisconsin to reduce the number of miles your food travels. Turn off lights when leaving a room unplug electronics when not in use, and purchase Energy Star appliances to reduce energy consumption. You can view current air quality online anytime, or sign up for air quality alerts that are sent by email or text message to stay informed. Wisconsin is committed to clean air. For more information, visit dnr.wi.gov and search air quality. So a lot of the same themes on what you can do to reduce your impact. Um, but here's a, just an update on the PM 2.5 NACs. The 
the list shows that the PM 2.5 and PM 10 24 hour standards, they're proposing no change through this recent action. And then the PM 2.5 annual standard, which is typically the one that they look at for um, non-attainment decisions, that they're proposing to reduce and taking comment on a range between nine and 10 micrograms per cubic meter. That's down from 12 micrograms per cubic meter, which was last set in 2012. Would you have anything to add to that one? Um, just that, you know, the, the comment opportunity on this, I believe, is open through this month. And um, not only is EPA proposing a range here on the annual standard of 9 to 10, but they're also taking comment from a range from 8 to 11. So even something that's a, a little bit lower than what they've proposed for the range. So um, I do... Um, I, I do think that EPA, you know, they have to address all comments received, and it is important, you know, that, that they hear um, from people on this. So, you know, I always encourage folks, you know, to get involved and, and to make comment to EPA um, if, if this is something that you're interested in providing kind of your unique experience on. So, just want to mention that, yeah. Uh, I, I attended the informational meeting they had a couple of weeks ago about, about that standard. Great. And uh, one of the things that really impressed me about this, and, and, it, and it also makes me think about the, our ozone problem, it said that uh, the advisory committee of scientists that were looking at, they're the ones that made the recommendation to the EPA. They said they looked at studies from 2012 until now that it, and, uh, thousands of new scientific studies they looked at as far as the health of citizens that have been impacted by this particular pollutant. And, and the thing that really pleased me about that is that you know, the present administration we have right now has directed the EPA to listen to these advisory committees and science, scientists' recommendations. And I'm wondering, and to take it over to ozone, uh, I'm wondering if, if that same kind of thing is happening as far as scientists looking at the health issues. When we talk about ozone, we talk about all the things we have to control uh, as far as emissions and stuff to meet that standard. But what's really happening to the health of our people? Do we really have a good handle on that? For, especially in Sheboygan County, you, you talk about us being a unique situation. Yep. You know, what's going on with the health issues with our citizens? Are they, are they getting worse? Is it because of ozone? What do we need to do about that? Yeah, that's a good question, and I, um, I, I'm, I'm glad to hear that you were part of that meeting, that public information session. Um, that's great to hear. Um, EPA does do those with a number of their rules, especially standards. Um, does give that opportunity um, to to provide feedback to them through that format. Standard setting um, is always supposed to be health based. And it is supposed to involve um, the Clean Air Science Advisory Committee. We sometimes um, let the acronym CASAC slip on that one, so I'll use it here. Um, they are um, specially, they're, they're nominated and selected um, scientists and other air quality um, experts that are tasked with reviewing, as you said, just hundreds and thousands of, of health-related studies um, and making recommendations or proposing a, a, a standard based on those studies and based on health impacts. So over time, what, what you have experienced here with standards, what we've experienced is as EPA learns more and that Clean Air Science Advisory Committee or CASAC learns more and has more health-related information to look at, what we've seen over time is really a, a lowering of standards or an understanding that these pollutants are impactful to people's health and um, they are impactful at lower lower levels, right? And so that's that's what we're seeing here with the PMNAX is a, a recommendation or new proposed range um, on the annual standard of something that's lower based on those health studies. So do they actually, for example, one I'm thinking about Sheboygan County, would they if, if they are going to take a serious look at what's happening as far as the health impact, are they communicating with all our medical facilities, trying to get information from them about what might be going on, what they're seeing as far as uh, you know, lots of different kinds of health issues that 
uh, are related to pollutants. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're looking at kind of the latest body of science um, based on studies primarily that have been peer reviewed and, and published. Um, I, I honestly don't know that they go kind of the, the step of, of contacting local health agencies. I think that's a really good question and, and something that we could strive to understand a bit more about the process. And maybe Rebecca? we're jumping ahead to mm -hmm. you, I apologize, but since you brought it up, um, is we've asked about this for Sheboygan County because yes. but I know we're a lower population, so CDC doesn't uh, look into that as, as much. We've been trying to work with some of the state health department, though. But I think I remember hearing, Katie, that you got some money recently through the um, Inflation Reduction Act to do a study in Milwaukee. And is that something we might, in Sheboygan, be able to piggyback off of or use when we're kind of advocating? I think so. That was the American Rescue Plan That's funding. So yeah, it's all kind of Not yeah. Easy. We're I'm losing track of it too. But um, it's that that one was specifically geared towards like in EPA's rest, a request for a proposal that was specifically for PM 2.5. Okay. There are other opportunities though that I think I would encourage you to apply for through the IRA funding that I've seen and I've thought of you. So I can. I can I'll send those. Touch. Yeah, I, I can send those to you. And it's some of them are even geared towards smaller, you know, community organizations like this. Mm -hmm. So I think that'd be a, a good thing that we should kind of continue to explore. I'm not scientifically minded, but that information just seems to me to be out of whack. Um, with, with all the scientific information, research, and whatever, and you tell, is this same? And maybe I'm just not understanding that the PM10 24 hour standard that was set 35 years ago is staying the same, even with all the scientific information and that the PM 2.5, 24-hour um, set, let's say, if even 15 years ago, that makes no sense to me. Yeah, there's been a lot of studies, especially shorter term. It's the the one that's proposed here for uh, has a proposed range for revision, as you pointed out, is the annual standard, kind of the longer term. And there has been some study about shorter term impacts um, being meaningful. You know, when it comes to, to health um, and, and and people's health. At, EPA is actually taking comment down to 25 micrograms per cubic meter on the 24 hour standard. And I think what that reflects is that there are a lot of different health studies and there are a number of folks who are on that KSAC committee and a, a range of different opinions. And so some of that identification that you know shorter term standards are meaningful as well um, is reflected in, in some of the opinion of some of the Clean Air Science Advisory Committee folks. So EPA has put out with this that they, they will take comment down to lower levels, and I would, I, I'm sure that they will get comment um, for lower levels. Um, as far as the, the PM10 standard, um, you're right, that has been not proposed to change. Um, and I think what this is reflecting here is that the PM2.5 um, is really the the health the the significant health risk standard. Um, so I, I think that was where EPA's focus was um, with this. But again, encourage you. I, I would encourage that comment and a look at the process here because, as you said, this you know was set in the 80s uh, that the PM10 standard and. Um, we always want to make sure that EPA was following the appropriate process. That's actually why they looked at, re-looked at the um, the uh, PM standard. It had actually been proposed for no revision um, not long ago, and um, th when the new administration came in, they they looked at that and and asked for a different consideration, just making sure that that scientific process was being followed here. And so this is the result of that work. Thanks for the question. All right, so kind of moving on, this just gives our most recent um, design values for the 24-hour PM 2.5 uh, 
standard, so you can see we're pretty well below the previous standard, but if they do drop it, um, the annual standard, we'll have a graph in the next year's trends report for that, but we didn't have it this year. Um, we'll be a little bit closer to that new standard at, at many of the sites, depending on where they set it. Um, so kind of that I thought was a good lead-in to air quality sensors because many of the air quality sensors that are available do monitor for PM 2.5 so it's kind of a way for citizen scientists to really contribute to the body of science that's available for monitoring data and it's unique to ozone in that these sensors are actually they're pretty precise but they're not necessarily accurate so they can track our regulatory monitors really well but they're oftentimes biased pretty high, especially when the, the concentrations are elevated due to fire. So you, you, you may be alarmed when you don't need to be. Um, but they are, we did develop a correction factor for Wisconsin, and they've been developed in different areas. We did a, a year-long study with um, six sites where we co-located a purple air sensor with our regulatory monitors, and then did a data analysis where we were able to develop an algorithm that people can apply their raw purple air data to and then get kind of more accurate data um, overall. We worked with EPA on this, so this was a national project. Um, and I'll just say before we, we get to that work, uh, sensors, they can't be used for regulatory purposes and I think uh, I kind of explained why that is. It's because of the really strict Clean Air Act requirements that are associated with regulatory monitoring. But they can be used for gaining like qualitative health information, making decisions on a daily basis. They're, they're re real time, they're at your home, so you can make a decision on if you have a child with asthma, whether or not to send them out to play that day. Um, and we're gonna continue to build our body of knowledge at the DNR in sensor work. So we've been kind of working with EPA to test sensors at libraries and things like that, and we have a few projects relate, related to air quality sensor work. <coughs> but this is kind of the pride and joy of the federal and state um, uh, collaboration with sensors. So the EPA's fire and smoke map incorporates regulatory monitoring data along with um, purple air sensors right now. They're thinking about bringing in more sensors um, and also satellite data. And this is for, uh, initially it was built for first responders to be able to make decisions about responding to wildfires and being protective of their health and like what type of respirator they may need to go into a fire situation. So this has been useful for communicating this data to the public and I think it's a really great collaborative tool that, that's been developed from feds and states. The correction factor is applied regionally for this, so the Wisconsin one is uh, reflected for the Midwest, and then I think there were some all around the United States that were also applied. And this just gives like a really high level overview of kind of all of the information that we're trying to gather and determine, and I think one of the buzzwords or buzz phrases that has been said a lot lately is like, what is fit for the purposes of your data needs. So like which type of monitoring technology is fit for what you need the data for. So that's what you always have to keep in mind when you're thinking about um, different, different data sources because it's kind of all over the board right now. So the government operated monitors, they're appropriate for making these really important decisions at a federal level that can be impactful on an economic scale for a state, for a business, for the public health in that area. So that's why they have all those QA re requirements and why you know, it's so costly to operate them. And then the mobile low cost sensors, you know, take that data with a grain of salt. It doesn't have a lot of quality assurance, but it does give you kind of a good idea of where highs and lows are. And then your stationary low cost sensors do the same, which is really valuable, especially for people you know, with conditions relative, especially to PM 2.5, that can be a real asthma trigger for people. And then the satellite-based remote sensors, that this is kind of a cool thing that we've been working with um, UW on. They've, um, they're working with NASA and they've recently launched a couple of 
additional satellites and our enhanced ozone monitoring efforts are actually the ground based the ground truth for those satellite deployments. So that's been kind of a cool use of our enhanced ozone monitoring network. So I think we are at the question Q&A, but we have had a lot of great questions and we appreciate that. I have some questions. Okay. Um, with, the, with the study with the mammal, with the mobile air monitoring lab, and I'm sure you don't have last year's done already, but what have been your kind of major surprises or takeaways? I mean, everyone's trying to blame, you know, our power plants. Um, but because these labs can kind of go down to those sources, what's, what's been really interesting for you? Uh, yeah, so the, um, there are two parts of the mammal. Like, there's the continuous monitoring, and I've discovered kind of more recently that that data has been really useful to the researchers in ground truthing that satellite data and in um, for our partners at LAGCO or Lake Michigan or <laughs> Wait, Lake Michigan Air Directors <laughs> Consortium. LAGCO. They, um, they use it for improving their models which is great because a lot of times the the national models um, they'll they'll say that Sheboygan, for example, monitor will attain in a certain amount of time, but that's inaccurate. So it it makes the grid smaller to allow for more accurate mod modeling. So that's what the mammal continuous parameters do. And then the, um, the carbonyl VOC, those volatile organic compounds, the, the data set was a little bit limited, so we learned a lot about data sets and how to get better data. Um, but the data that we did glean, and I think we looked specifically at June 3rd and August 5th of 2021, we found that there were significant differences between Sheboygan and Chewaukee on those days. Um, there were exceedances. Generally, we found that mobile sources, as we, we confirmed that mobile sources were the largest contributor. Chewaukee being uh, positioned in a prairie, right. we were kind of like contaminating the samples with biogenic emissions, which we wouldn't expect. So biogenic is like uh, what, your, what trees and plants kind of off gas. And so we were collecting that, which was a little bit of a contamination factor. But so it showed different um, speciated samples than the Sheboygan sample, which was located in a parking lot. So we learned that about how to do sighting better or the limitations of that type of monitoring. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. So it really is those mobile on-road kind of sources that, which is in a way kind of good news because that's something we can, right. you know, hopefully legislatively or, you know, personally do something about. Um, where, what happens with the mammal data? Is there somewhere that we can see that or? Yep. That's on Widen, so I can send you the link after this. It's kind of hard to find. And it's, we have to quality assure it, so it takes us a bit to get it upload, quality assured and uploaded to Widen. And will the enhanced ozone study continue then? I mean, are we going to get our mammal back? Or? I don't know if Sheboygan will get the mammal back Come next on. year. Well, the <laughs> um, we're trying to understand a little bit. Is it Door County? It's Door County. It's not Door, it's Milwaukee. So we're. Um, <laughs> In an effort to understand like the speciated speciation of those mobile sources, we're deploying it next year and to help support that ARP funded grant, we're deploying it at the Milwaukee office. Um, the new Milwaukee office is located like right on a major rail artery coming right out of the port of Milwaukee. Where we and, now have a cruise ship. Yeah, right. So a really busy port that's always expanding. So right out of the port of Milwaukee and then right below the freeway interchange there. So we're trying to just kind of understand the mobile sources even better too. And so Rebecca, I know you want to ask us about IRA funding. Yes. Yeah, and there is part of what this ARP project, or the American Rescue Plan funded project in Milwaukee can do is to um, help us understand some of the um, sources of emissions in and coming out of the port, and that's important. Our timing is, is all right on this because there is funding um, through IRA, this is the Inflation Reduction Act. There is funding that's um, specifically set aside for ports in non-attainment areas. So we wanna set ourselves up to be able to um, 
to try to get some of that funding so that we can really address not just what may or may not be happening in the port, but also ports means goods transport. It means things like the trucks and what's coming out of there, rail lines, et cetera. So we want to be able to set ourselves up really well to understand how we can take um, make use of, of some of that funding that's going to be available for non-attainment areas because we know, you know, those mobile source emissions, whether truck, ships, you know, out in the, the lake, um, you know, cars, rail, all of that is contributing to air quality issues, I mean, even here in Sheboygan. Um, we also are working with LAGCO on the use of that IRA money because we know that we're really impacted by what's happening um, like in the Chicago area. And there are ports and goods transport and heavy duty truck corridors um, there as well. So we really want to um, continue to expand what we know about mobile sources and continue to, to push for appropriate you know, regulation, federal regulation um, there as well. Um, I, I do want to let you know about too, um, this is not IRA related, but EPA sets compliance priorities, things that they're really going to focus on um, for a couple of years. And they give us the opportunity to see those in advance and to comment on those. And one of their compliance priorities for the last couple of years had been looking at heavy duty trucks and instances of tampering, which we understand to be a really big contributor um, to pollution issues. So that's when trucks are, you know, their, their um, emissions control system is um, adjusted, right, to, um, yeah, yeah, it's adjusted, and, you know, and, and for a range of, of reasons, but that can lead to um, more emissions than should be coming from that truck. And one of EPA's compliance priorities, as I said, had been to, to really focus on tampering, heavy-duty truck tampering. And they had proposed to kind of deprioritize that and make that core work, and that's another place where we've been vocal. Like, you know, we've, we've got to continue to have um, you know, we, we don't, again, we don't control, we don't regulate mobile source emissions, we don't regulate the trucks. So where EPA can do that, we really, really need their help, especially um, in this part of the country. So we're really um, focusing on, you know, continuing to be vocal, continuing to engage on mobile source emissions and to ask EPA, you know, to do what they can do um, where it's their role to do so. Which is really interesting because I've always, and I know I've probably talked to you all about this before, but our airport here in Sheboygan is going to be expanding. And we're even looking at federal earmarks to help with some of that expansion. And, and if that is something that we should be looking at and adding to our the inventory um, for Sheboygan County. I know we've heard a lot, like you could turn off every bus and light and everything in Sheboygan and you'd still have bad ozone. But my concern is uh, there might be some things we could do to address here so maybe we aren't impacting Door County. Um, and also, with the good neighbor policy, I think Wisconsin, we're going to have to do something. We can't just say, you guys yeah. do that. But what do you think about the airport? Is that something we should be looking at? Or is there a threshold for when those become part of your? There's, um, so again, those are emissions that we don't regulate. That said, we do emissions inventory work and do look at sources like airports. Um, we actually have somebody that uh, works in our program that's really, an, I would say, an expert on, on how to understand emissions from things like that. So I, I think that it's something um, to be aware of, for sure. And I, I think there's probably some information out there already on some of the emissions. We could take that back and, and see what exists and, and connect with you. Um, so you at least kind of have a, a starting point. So I do think it's important to understand what your emission sources are. Just know that, you know, aircraft, um, the focus there, especially small aircraft, and forgive me, I'm, I'm not familiar with Sheboygan Airport and kind of what goes in and out of there. Um, but smaller aircraft um, are still use, you know, leaded aviation fuel. And so that, yeah, that's, yeah, absolutely. So that tends to be the focus when we talk about airports right now, is some of those smaller airports and um, aviation gas or aviation fuel that's leaded. Um, but yeah, we let us take that back and see what we know exists um, from an emissions inventory perspective. And I don't want to be hogging this. Does anyone, <laughs> anyone else have a question? Yeah, I'm curious about the 
Oh, okay, yeah, I have another one. Oh, go ahead. Um, so, I know you were saying that, um, like, Wisconsin doesn't regulate mobile sources. Um, and that's because the Clean Air Act only made the exception for California, I believe, to be able to set their own kind of mobile Mission. That's um yeah you're referring to I think it's uh one, section 177 of the Clean Air Act that it it's a waiver process that allows other uh, allows states to adopt more stringent standards like California that's a process that um, other states have been attempting to go through a, as well. Um, I guess what I mean more when I say that we don't regulate mobile source emissions, we, we don't really have the, the ability to kind of set our own standards and then sort of regulate what the cars and trucks on the road are, are doing. Um, that's not, you know, the, the um, some of the onboard diagnostics and things like that, that you know, the, the tampering and, and things of that nature, that's something that our DOT gets a little more involved in. We're certainly involved with them, um, but it's, it's not something specifically that, that we do to manage um, emissions or emission reductions. Okay. So then, I, I, like I think Minnesota was recently mm -hmm. uh, adopting the California standards. Um, so would that be something that the DNR here would initiate, or would that be a different agency? That's a process <laughs> where that's something where if if you're interested in in that, those are things that start with the state legislature. So, yeah. <laughs> so you know, I always try to when I'm with you guys or, or with other groups, um, citizen groups especially who are interested, I always do say, you know, get involved, talk to your legislator, make sure that they understand that this is an issue that's very important to you. Um, there are uh, plenty of legislators who we do talk with on a, a periodic basis or regular basis as well about the concerns here in, in Sheboygan County and other parts of the state. And I, you know, that's just something I definitely want to leave you with. Make sure your legislators hear from you and understand your unique position. You are in a unique situation here, um, you know, being along the lake shore. And um, it's something that I always encourage. And as a plug, our legislators will be here uh, Monday at 9 o'clock in this room. It's not the most convenient time for folks who are working. Uh, they're going on a little budget tour, and I think to make a plug for to support natural resources and our natural resources staff and scientists um, and play nice with your neighbors down the lake is, is, is really important. And speaking of which, have you found it more difficult now to do the implementation plans since the county's been split? Is that double work, or is that... It's not... There's nothing that the lakeshore can do. Yeah. It's not double work. The, the complication is um, when we're doing planning, like uh, when we're uh, doing like an attainment plan to say here's how we're going to work towards attaining a standard, we are responsible for doing emissions inventories as part of those plans. And when you have kind of, those tend to be on a county basis. So that's kind of, that's the more complicating part besides just keeping track of which road is which road. Well, exactly. And <laughs> yeah. counts. Yeah. Only over here, but not over there. When that's not how air works, people. Yeah. So the emissions inventories are are really the most difficult part of that, and that's something um, I think you have a um, like a regional planning commission um, here, Bay Area, I think, and and that's something that we work with them on, and it has become more complicated with the the split. But we do think that that better reflects the parts of the county that are actually experiencing those elevated ozone levels. And with the permitting process, thinking about something like we just had the Ryder Cup here, you know, lots and lots of people, and now I'm reading, we're going to have, what is it, motor, the motorboat, powerboat yeah. thingy? Is that something that this region should get like a permit for or some kind of offset? I'm not a huge fan of offsets, I don't really know how they work, but <laughs> is that something that is like, wow, interesting? They are probably permitted for a number of different purposes, but not for air quality. Right. Bring on boats. <laughs>
Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I've been to these kind of meetings in the past and read things from the city, and is this totally wrong? People in this group, I'm assuming all of us, we're concerned about where the pollution is coming from, how we can make it better for health reasons. But I've always gotten the impression that the city and county administration who are looking at tax base are more concerned that we're being, de we are uh, non, what's the word? A non no growth zone. zone. Uh, and they're mostly concerned because they can't have certain manufacturers and companies come in because they're going to, they pollute a little bit and then we'll be in even more in non-attainment. Mm -hmm. Isn't there, am I wrong about that? Isn't there a little bit of a difference between how the city administration feels about our non-attainment and why we have it and doesn't want it than how we feel about that? Yes. Okay. And certainly, economy is an, an important part of a, a county and a city and, and administration. Um, and, you know, the, the Clean Air Act was designed to recognize that and to, to you know, note that a healthy economy is important as, as well. Um, but health of, of our citizens is important. I think the video mentioned there that um, the majority of Wisconsin's population lives in an area attaining standards. That was with kind of that, those smaller attainment areas. That's the correction we need to make. It's actually 33% of the state lives in an area that's not attaining uh, right now the, the ozone standard, the 2015 ozone standard. So um, health of people and health of economy are both supposed to be considered in the Clean Air Act. Um, and, you know, I, I think you mentioned offsets and you know things like that in your previous answer. That's some of the ways that um, the area is designed to kind of be able to grow when in non-attainment. Anytime a, a source here, the, the facilities that do want to come in here and um, build, expand, um, et cetera, they're subject to kind of different requirements relative to air quality. Something that they do have to do, especially for a, a larger source of emissions. If they're trying to come into, say, Sheboygan County, the portion of Sheboygan that's not attaining, they have to offset their emissions. So they have to find ways to reduce emissions elsewhere in that non-attainment area. It's kind of like carbon credits, but in this case, they have to um, get reductions of um, the components that make up ozone, so oxides of nitrogen or volatile organic compounds, but kind of similar, kind of a, a program where um, sources can kind of trade back and forth. They do have monetary value, things like that. So the idea is that if you're going to put pollution in an area that's not attaining, you've got to take out more than that before you're allowed to, to be able to do that. So some of the ways that the Act tries to recognize that economy is important to. Um, so I just, you know, mentioned that there's a number of different requirements that they're subject to. And I, I think a facility that's coming into an area that's not attaining a standard, um, either they're, they know they're subject to more stringent requirements. And if you're looking at it, an area that's not attaining versus an area that is attaining that has less requirements, um, you know, chances are, are good that the source is going to go with less requirements. And so I think city and county administrators kind of get concerned about economy and jobs and things like that in those cases. Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to follow up on that. I'm going to give a, a cynical view of, of what I think about all this with these standards. Um, you know, I think any standards we talked about tonight, ideally they should be lower. You know, it's sort of the health of our citizens. But I think those standards, any standards that are made because of the input that we give, and I, I am sure you get tons of input from business and manufacturers, and our policymakers are, are very influential in terms of making sure that things aren't done too strictly. So I look at standards as a compromise. It's a compromise and, and it's healthy, I say it's healthy, for the economy, for businesses, for manufacturers. And then when you look at the other part, the actual health of citizens, I think those standards we can live with as long as you're in between the age group of being a child and an old mother like me that does not have any under underlying health conditions, you can live with that. You can live that and stay fairly healthy. But we have to worry about our children because they're more susceptible to the kind of things that are happening with air quality and older people 
you know, and I've experienced some of those things when I moved here 16 years ago to Sheboygan County. And my doctor told me after I complained about things after a bike ride and stuff, you know, why, what's going on? He said, you live in Sheboygan County. That's what he told me. You know, that was his answer to why I was having those, those problems. So I guess what really happens is that those of us that don't have uh, health issues are in between the two groups I mentioned. You know, you can live with those standards. If you're an older person, if you've got underlying conditions, if you're a child, you need to be vigilant. You have to pay attention to air quality readings and alerts and all that kind of stuff. And stay inside or not be too active when you're outside uh, to protect yourself. So I, I look at the whole thing as kind of a compromise when you look at those standards. Yeah, that's, really that's got an interesting perspective. Yeah. I really want to thank you both for coming. You know, this is very important to me as someone that used to work with kids and, and yeah. the outdoors. It's, it, you know, it's getting a little bit better, but I, I want more sense of urgency. I am loving the alerts. They are better night before. And so keep that up. I think you added a climate person to kind of help, like, hmm, we've got some pre, we've got a cloud, we've got a plume, looking at some stuff. Uh, and I really appreciate all you do. You, they're very easy to work with, you, you know, they're very responsive, so God bless the DNR. <laughs> Thank you. We're glad to be here. Thanks for having us. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.